Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and the King James text today reads, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men, to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Walking Intimately with the Lord. Will you bow your heads with me one more moment? Master, we love you, God, today, and we're thankful for the word of the Lord. It is the preaching of the word of God that brings faith into our lives. It is the anointing of the Holy Ghost that makes this preaching valuable, that makes it, Lord, uh, capable of bringing change into our lives, that causes the ear of the hearer to be convinced of truth, that allows us, God, to be challenged, to be changed by that which we hear. Anoint today, O oh God, the speaker, that I might deliver this word in a fashion that will bring glory and honor to your name. Let me speak only that which you would have me to speak, and allow me to remain silent where the Spirit would have me to remain silent. Bless the ear of every hearer. Open our ears and stop our hearts, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want to read just a little bit more of Matthew chapter 6 to you, but I'm jumping from verse 8 down to verse number 16, because the Lord continues the thought process that he has begun in the first eight verses at verse number 16. He said, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, 
where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I've got to tell you today that in the last 27 years or so that I've been engaged in LGBT affirming ministry, my ministry has undergone a tremendous metamorphosis of a sort. I've seen God give me what I consider to be some of the greatest messages he's ever given me to preach in all my ministry. I have found myself walking deeper, understanding better, feeling more gratitude toward God for my understanding and the revelation of his word in the last 25 or so years than I've ever felt in all my life. I've noticed that the messages he gives me are very different in nature than the messages he used to give me many years ago. I'm preaching to a different audience. It would only make sense that the nature of the message would be somewhat different. But one thing that I'm grateful for, one thing that I have found, is that this ministry is not about superfluous, uh, shallow religion. No, the word that God has given me to preach in the last many years has been a word that is designed to lead the people of God who would listen. There are many who hear, but they do not listen. Right but would lead the people of God who would listen away from religion and into a deeper, more intimate walk with God. And the Holy Ghost has spoken to my spirit and informed me that it is His desire to do just that. Amen. It is not God's will that we walk in some shallow man-made religion. It is not God's will that we walk in some form or some fashion of religion that meets the approval and meets the standard of men. Mm -hmm. But rather it is the will of God that we walk in intimate, close communion and fellowship with him. God gives believers the Holy Ghost so that we might know him more personally and more intimately. People who do not value or do not understand the value of the Holy Ghost baptism today do not understand that one of the primary purposes and one of the primary benefits of the Holy Ghost baptism is that it brings you into a much, much deeper, closer, more intimate walk with the Lord. I'm going to tell you, God will never be real to you like He is when He fills you with the Holy Ghost. When God baptizes you with the Holy Ghost, I'm going to tell you, friend, you will know God is real. You will never doubt God is real. You will know it every day of your life that God is real. You're not going to base it upon, uh, well, this prayer was answered and that prayer was answered. Because I'm going to tell you, there's always somebody in the world who's going to tell you, oh, well, that was just coincidence. That was just happenstance. That was just things falling in together at the right time. You know, that's why it appears that God is answered your prayer, but that's really not what it was. But let me tell you, when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, sweetie, and you feel the power of God, and you feel 
the indwelling of his spirit and you literally feel like I can't even explain it you feel the grace of God you feel you experience the love of God I'm gonna tell you I've said it before I'll say it again I know when I got the Holy Ghost I suddenly loved everything I laid my eyes on I loved flagpoles I loved uh, telephone poles I loved um, fire hydrants I loved car doors there was nothing I could look at that I suddenly just didn't have this overflowing sense of love for. You suddenly see everything in a brand new light because God in his divinity and in his sovereignty has saturated your spirit with his own. And I'm going to tell you, when your, when your spirit gets married to the Spirit of Almighty God through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if the only thing you experience is speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance, you haven't gotten a whole lot of nothing. I know a lot of people call themselves Pentecostal. I know a whole lot of people who call themselves Holy Ghost filled. But I'm going to tell you something, honey. The only thing they got when they got the Holy Ghost was speaking with other tongues. Speaking with other tongues is only the initial, listen to me, the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. you got to remember the infilling of the Holy Ghost is a spiritual transaction. Therefore, everything could transpire, you might say, invisibly. Everything could happen in a manner that is not visible to the naked eye. But believers need to know who their fellow believers are. We need to know. In the Word of God, the requirement for bishops, the requirement for elders and deacons in the church, one of the requirements is that they be full of the Holy Ghost. Well, how do we know? If they've got the Holy Ghost, how do we even have a clue? If, they, if it's a spiritual transaction that takes place and it's invisible to the naked eye and God's people have no way of bearing witness to one having the Holy Ghost, how can we know? But throughout the book of Acts, you find over and over again throughout the book of Acts, that every time the Holy Ghost was poured out upon some believer, upon some body of believers, every single time those who received the Holy Ghost spoke with other tongues, meaning simply they spoke in another language. That's all it means, an unlearned language, a language they did not know already. But they spoke in an unknown language as the Spirit of God made them able to do so. And if I could explain it to you this way, when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, He breathes life into your spirit. And when God flips on the switch, and your spirit, which was dead because of sin and unbelief, when your spirit comes to life, just like a newborn baby, you cry out, you make a noise. When your spirit begins to speak, when your spirit begins to uh, express itself, it will do so through your body because your spirit and your body are married one to another. Your spirit's in your body. So your spirit can't do something without your body participating. But what God does is God causes your spirit to express itself and to speak in a different language. That way you know the difference between communicating in the flesh versus communicating from your spirit. But at the same time, not only does speaking with other tongues then demonstrate to the believer that they've received the Holy Ghost because now their spirit is expressing itself and speaking in another language, but it also is a testimony to those around them that they've received the Holy Ghost. That's how the church is able to bear witness that this believer has received the Holy Ghost. How do I know? Honey, I was there. I watched them receive the Holy Ghost. I, I've been in churches. I was in a church one time when Sister Bruce, my friend, was preaching. And she was a wonderful preacher. 
and she was preaching and the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, go lay hands on that lady. Now sit to Bruce in the middle of her sermon. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, go over there to the other side of the sanctuary, lay hands on that woman sitting right there. For a minute I thought, I said, Lord, we're in the, Sister Bruce is preaching. She's in the middle of her message, you know. And the Lord said, you get up and go over there and lay hands on her. I knew better at this point than to doubt God, so I stood up. Sister Bruce knew how to walk in the Spirit, so she wasn't all offended. She wasn't in trouble. I walked over to this lady. I looked at her. I laid my hands on her. I said, in the name of Jesus. When I did, she threw her hands up in the air and started speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. She received the Holy Ghost. See, she was ripe. She was ready. She was right at the point where God was able to fill her. And the Lord said, all she needs is for somebody to go over there and lay hands on her. And I did, and boom, that fast she received the Holy Ghost. See, it's a wonderful thing to be able to know that you've received the Holy I was a kid in the altar when Brother Counts was preaching at our little uh, full gospel tabernacle in Naugatuck, Connecticut. And I was just about five in the altar when the Holy Ghost fell on me and I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance and I was so excited. I knew I had gotten the Holy Ghost because I spoke with other tongues. People around me knew that I had received the Holy Ghost because I spoke with other tongues. My Aunt Dorothy, before she became a believer, used to visit my grandparents' house, her sister's house, and her brother-in-law's house. And they had ten children, my mother being the oldest of them. And this is long before she became a Holy Ghost-filled Pentecostal Christian herself. But she said, CJ, they used to have family altar at the house, and they all would be praying around the living room at the sofa and at the chairs and what have you. She said, and I would stand there sometimes and watch. She said, and your Aunt Laurel would sit there and be praying. And she said, tears would be streaming down her face and she'd be speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. She said, I would look and said, I'd just get chills. She said, because I knew that child wasn't acting. I knew that child wasn't putting on a show for nobody. She said, I remember asking your grandmother, my mother's mother, I remember asking her, Dorothy said, if, does Laurel know what she's doing? Does she, you know, because she was curious about all this. And grandma explained to her, yes, you know, when you have the Holy Ghost, and you're praying, all you have to do to pray in the Spirit, all you have to do is get to that place where you are Spirit-centered. In other words, where you're not worried about who's next to you or what's going on around you, but you're fully focused and centered in your Spirit. And you allow your Spirit to express itself. You allow your Spirit to pray. But the Bible said the Spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophet. So in other words, your Spirit can't do anything you don't allow your Spirit to do. So therefore, when you're praying, and when you're uh, worshiping, you know, you've got to allow the Spirit within you, allow the Holy Ghost to touch your Spirit, and then allow your Spirit to express itself. When you see people shouting, and you see people dancing, and you see people running the aisles in a Pentecostal church, they have allowed their Spirit access to their body. Do you follow what I'm saying? They're feeling something in their Spirit. They may be going through the hardest time of their life. They may be battling cancer. They may be going through divorce. They may be struggling with illness. But all of a sudden the Spirit of God touches their spirit and speaks to their soul and says I've given you healing. I've given you victory. You don't have to worry. And all of a sudden in their spirit they feel like running. All of a sudden in their spirit they feel like dancing. And their spirit, they let their spirit have control. And that's what we call dancing in the spirit. That's why we call it shouting in the spirit and running in the spirit. It's not about 
the Holy Ghost coming down and taking control of your body and making you do something. No, no, no. That's not what's happening. It's not what's happening. But the intimacy that the Holy Ghost brings us into is such that God is able to communicate something to us. He doesn't have to speak audibly so we can hear it in our hearing. He communicates spirit to spirit. The Bible said Jesus spoke the words, God is a spirit. Therefore, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God's a spirit. God does not communicate in fleshly terms as we communicate. But when you have the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden, you're in this intimate, intimate. It's, you know, the Bible talks about marriage as the two become one flesh. Well, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, your spirit and God's spirit become one. You become married to God in effect. And what happens is now God can communicate with you invisibly, unseen, unheard. You will simply know. All of a sudden you will know something. And I mean, you can be going through the hardest trial. You can be going through the hardest difficulty you've ever gone through in your life. You can be struggling with addiction. You can be struggling with drug addiction. You can be struggling with all kinds of issues. And all of a sudden, God will either fill you with the Holy Ghost if you've not had the Holy Ghost, or if you have the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden, God will communicate by His Spirit directly to your spirit. It is done. It is finished. I've done it. You're delivered. You're saved, you're healed, whatever the need is, it's done. And when that happens, your spirit might get happy. Your spirit might get delirious. Your spirit might rejoice. And then all of a sudden you see somebody start to dance. They're dancing a dance of, G of joy. They're dancing a dance of victory. You see, that's what's happening. There are times when the Spirit of God touches us and the power of God is so overwhelming to our human body. Now there are examples throughout the Bible of this happening. Where people were in the presence of God. Elisha's vision, Isaiah's vision where he stood before the Lord. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne. He was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. But you read how People who are in the presence of God and they experience a touch of the raw power of God's Spirit. Sometimes their body just literally falls out like they're dead. This is what some of these clown shows on television have made a circus out of. People being slain in the Spirit. That's a very real thing. Can it be faked? Yeah. Can, are there preachers that fake it? Sure there are. But I'm going to tell you something. It's as real as rain, honey. I've had the Spirit of God touch me on a couple of occasions in such a way that literally I can't even explain it. I could not even, I could not even hold my body up. My knees gave out. And I fell straight backwards like I was dead as a doorknob. Didn't hurt my head, didn't hurt nothing, didn't hit nothing, didn't experience any harm or injury from it. If it's God, God will take care of you. If it's not God, you're on your own, you better have insurance. Mm -hmm. Say, Pastor, why are you talking about all this? This isn't what our text was about today. Well, it is. It is. Many live religious lives in full display of their fellow man, while others walk spiritually, intimately with the Lord, keeping their spiritual practices private and unobserved. 
The Lord in our primary text today teaches us that our walk with God ought to be intimate, personal, and private. Those who live their religion to be observed reap the rewards of that public demonstrativeness. They win the accolades and praise of men. But those who walk intimately with the Lord are laying up for themselves rewards in heavenly places where their heart is found. Religion on display demonstrates that our religion is grounded in worldly, earthly, carnal desires and motivations. If you're living your religion on display, I love Christian people who, you know, they're in the middle of a restaurant. They sit out in the middle of the restaurant. They don't sit in a booth off on the side. They sit out on a table in the middle of it. And bless God, the meal comes, and all of a sudden they hold hands across the table. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this food. Oh, Lord, bless this food, God. Blah, 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 blah. And they carry on and on and on. I'm going to tell you a little secret. That is not pleasing to God. You're not supposed to live your religion on display. You're supposed to walk spiritually before the Lord. When I go out to eat, and I've had people in this very church who came from Pentecostal background, and I promise you, they were raised in churches where it's all about religion on display, where it's all about, uh, you're, so, you know, you're supposed to follow this shallow religious practice, you know, where everything's about what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it, whereas I'm trying trying to teach us how to walk with God more intimately, more personally. Food comes before me, and you'll, you won't even notice me. I'll just kind of bow my head. Thank you, Jesus, for this food. Boom. Done. I'll tell you another secret. I have a habit. Now, I've been at places in my life where I didn't have any food. I've been through some tough experiences, folks. Do not kid yourself. I've been through some very, very difficult times. And some of them weren't so long ago. I've been in places where I hadn't eaten in days because I had no food. I had no way of, of buying food. But I'm going to tell you, when I buy groceries and I bring them home, I tend to thank the Lord for those groceries as I'm putting them away. I'll be praising the Lord for my food as I'm putting it away. I'm asking the Lord to bless my food. You see, you don't have to bless your meal just once it's prepared and once it's sitting in front of you. Who said that's how it has to be done? Do you follow what I'm telling you? But see, religion says that's how you're supposed to do it. Well, it's funny because we got Christian people today. Oh, the church in America is under persecution. We Christians are being persecuted. You're an idiot. You are an idiot. You are an idiot. I, I don't even know another word to use because, honey, that is the best possible word to use for you. You can sit in a restaurant and you can pray and you can put your religion on display and they nobody walk up and arrest you. They nobody put a gun to your head. Got news for you. Oh, they've taken prayer out of schools. Um, excuse me, they took prayer out of schools. Madeline Murray O'Hare, the great atheist queen had been successful in removing mandatory prayer out of public schools long before I was a kid or while I was a kid. When I was in high school, prayer had been out of schools for a long time. I went to the principal of the high school I attended, and I said, Mr. Leonard, I wonder if it would be possible for us to have a room before school every morning so that we could have a prayer meeting. Mr. Leonard said, yes, sir, you sure may. He said, I'll let you use the main uh, conference room, which was right next to his office, literally right next to his office. Well, we were Pentecostal. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I knew our prayer meetings weren't altogether quiet. You know, I thought, oh, Lord, he would put us right next door to his office, you know. 
We started that prayer meeting in Norfolk High School with about probably maybe four people, I think, four people, me and Anita, and there were a couple of the kids from the church I grew up in, and Tommy, by the end of the first year, we had like 40, 50 people crammed into that room every morning praying. We'd pray, I mean we'd pray. We'd have some, ooh, we'd have some prayer meetings. When I moved to Texas, Mr. Leonard wrote me a letter of recommendation for the principal at the new high school I'd be attending. And in that letter of recommendation, Mr. Leonard said, if you don't already have a morning prayer meeting at your school, he said, I would highly recommend that you let Mr. Morrow pull one together for you. He said he... Uh, started one in our school, he said, and by the end of the first year, the smoking area in our high school was practically empty. We actually had an area that uh, was partly indoors, partly outdoors, and the kids that smoked, they actually allowed them to smoke in this area. And uh, he said, by the end of the first year, you could walk through that smoking area and count how many people were actually smoking. Did we run around the school preaching against smoking? Did we run around the school? Did we even pray that God would thin out the smoke? We didn't. But I'm going to tell you something. When you do something in secret, the Word of God said, God will reward you openly. God was doing things in that school that we weren't even asking God to do. But we weren't asking him, oh, we need to be able to pray in our homeroom. We need to be able to pray openly. We need to be able to lead the class in prayer. Hallelujah. Glory to God, you idiots. Prayer had long been removed from mandatory in classrooms, but I was still allowed to pray in school. Tommy, every time I took a test, I'd bow my head and say, Lord, help me take this test. Help me remember what I need to remember. You know, help me to call upon my, uh, my, my studies and remember what I put effort into studying. You know, I prayed all through school. I never had a problem praying in school. Nobody ever grabbed me by the arm, dragged me off to the principal's office, and demanded that I be punished because I was praying in school. I'm sick and tired of idiots that call themselves Christians who are no more spiritual than a grapefruit. Defining things in a manner that is asinine and foolish and stupid persecution. Honey, there are countries in this world where you wouldn't dare join hands across the table and begin to pray over your food because if you did, you'd be arrested and dragged off to jail. Right. And you know what? These same cowards, these same mouth-offs, these same morons who complain about persecution would be the first ones in those countries to keep their mouths shut and to suddenly make their religious practice private, personal, intimate the way it was meant to be from the beginning. How do you think the early church was able to navigate its way through persecution if they were as demonstrative and public in all their practices as Christians today claim we're supposed to be? Are you ashamed of the gospel? If you're not ashamed of Jesus, then pray over your meal in public like you would at home. No, it has nothing to do with me being ashamed. I'm not ashamed to make love to my spouse, but I'm not going to do that in the middle of the street either. No. Nope. Hello now, I'm not ashamed to kiss my baby, but I'm not going to kiss my baby in the middle of the bus either. Do you follow what I'm saying? There has nothing to do with shame. It has to do with there are things which are appropriate in certain places. And in our primary text today, what the Lord was expounding, you notice I'm not going verse for verse, but I'm talking about the entirety of what he said. He was expounding on spiritual practices, prayer, 
fasting, things of this nature, uh, giving alms, you know, giving to the poor. And he said, you know, do these things secretly. Do these things privately. If you're going to walk spiritually, then let your walk with God, let the things you do toward God or in his name, do them in a manner that is private and intimate. Why? Because you've got the Holy Ghost. God's there. He sees everything you're doing. The other day, Tommy and I went to a McDonald's to get a frozen uh, coffee drink. Well, I don't know why. Well, all we ordered was two drinks. They gave me one of the drinks, and they asked me, can you pull over there to that parking spot over there, and we'll bring the other one out. Well, the parking spot was kind of, you know, to me it was far away from the building. Normally they have those kind of parking spots right there close to the building, you know. But this one was kind of across the parking lot a little bit, and they had them numbered, you know. And so I pulled over where they asked me to pull over, and this young black girl came out, and she brought the drink with her. And she brought it, she handed it to me, and I said to her, I said, Honey, hold on a minute, just before you go anywhere, hold on a minute. So I want to give you something. And I reached in my my pocket, I pulled out my little change purse and I, I reached for a dollar and I gave her a dollar. I said, you had to walk an awful far away. I don't know why that is so far that they have, you know, for their drive through parking spots. So I gave her a dollar and I look at Tommy and Tommy's giving me this smirky look on his face. And I looked at him and I said, what, I can't be generous? See, the thing is, Tommy knows me intimately. We know each other. He knows how I am. He knows who I am. He knows how I act. He's sitting there. I don't have a car full of people. I'm not doing this to impress anybody. I'm just doing this because seriously, bless her little heart, the girl had to walk a pretty good ways just to bring me one lousy little coffee. Would have been different if it was a whole meal, you know, something like that. But see, it's just about walking with God is meant to be intimate. The Holy Ghost baptism brings us into an intimacy with God. See, a lot of people talk about the fact that Jesus is spoken of as being Emmanuel. The angel told Mary, His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So when Jesus left the earth physically, was God no longer with us? Was he no longer Emmanuel for us? Was he only Emmanuel for the first century church, for the first apostles and for the first disciples of Christ, the first believers? No, not at all. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. Listen, he said, I will come to you. Didn't say, I'm going to send somebody else. He said, I will come to you. Paul the Apostle talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost said, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Well, I got news for you. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, whatever term you want to use in reference to the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. Why? Because the Word of God tells us, for by one Spirit are ye all baptized into one body. Whether ye be bond or free, whether ye be male or female, whether ye be Jew or Greek, we're all baptized into one body by one Spirit. The Word of God teaches that the gifts of the Spirit operate by one Spirit, by the same Spirit. Uh, the gift of tongues, by the same Spirit, the gift of prophecy, by the same Spirit, the working of miracles, by the same Spirit, the, uh, the uh, gifts of healings. There's no such thing as the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ as separate spirits. No, 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 no. No. Everything God does is by one Spirit. Therefore, whatever you want to call that Spirit, it is the Spirit of Christ. It is the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So guess what? For the Holy Ghost-filled believer, for the church today, He is still God with 
us. Hallelujah. He is still Emmanuel. You see, the Old Testament believers didn't have that. The Old Testament Jews didn't have God with them the way we have God with us today. But God leads us into an intimate personal walk. He leads us to walk spiritually and not to walk before the world in demonstration of our faith and in demonstration of our religion. In Matthew 14, 22 and 23, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. I've had people in this church, and I know... They're so stuck in religion. They're, they're so stuck in doing things the way they've always been raised to do things. You know, Oh, bless God, churches should have prayer meetings. Brother Mara didn't have enough prayer meetings. Brother Charles didn't call enough prayer meetings. We should have had prayer meetings. Uh, no, you should have known how to pray. I'm going to tell you, I'd rather pray alone than pray with anybody. And when I do pray with somebody, I want to pray with somebody I know knows how to pray. I want to pray with somebody who is as intimate in their prayer life as I am mine. What do you mean by that? I want to be able to pray in the same room with somebody and not even have to know they're there. And know that they're no more concerned about me being there than I am about them being there. Because I'm not there for them, I'm there for God. Hello now. I want to be able to get in the Spirit. I want to be able to pray in the Holy Ghost. I want to be able to shout if I feel a shout coming on. I don't want to be in a room with somebody who's going to put a damper on the atmosphere. Somebody who's a wet blanket, who's going to put my fire out. While I'm trying to get in the spirit, they're working on putting my fire out. Hello now. I don't want to be in a room with somebody like that. I've had people in this church born and raised in Pentecostal churches. And I'm going to tell you something, a little secret. I did not enjoy praying with that person at all. They weren't walking it as spiritually and as intimately as they ought to have been walking and it hindered me when I would try to engage in spiritual practice, not religious practice. Mark chapter 14 verses 32 and thir through 35. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here, wait here, he said, and watch. And he went forward a little and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. When we do have prayer meetings in church, I always, I don't pray in the middle of everything. I always try to find some little off in the corner spot I can find where I'm away from everybody else. I want to get in the Spirit. I want to be intimate with Jesus. I'm going to tell you, when you get this Holy Ghost, it's the difference to, you know, you may feel God touch you. You may feel blessed of the Lord sometimes in church or what have you, and you don't yet have the Holy Ghost, but that's like shaking hands with Jesus. You get the Holy Ghost, it's like making love with Him. That's, I'm serious. That's the difference in the level of intimacy that you experience. I want to be in a place where I can get intimate, you know, where I can be intimate with the Lord, where I can really just focus and center and let my spirit communicate with God directly and not be distracted by people who are praying things that 
are ridiculous and saying things that are distracting. You know what I'm saying? And, and I mean, there are some people I know, and I'm telling you, the way they pray is so distracting, and it, it just pull your mind away from what you're trying to do. <sighs> Anything I can't stand is somebody who prays, woe is me. I can't stand people who always talk about, oh God, I'd be a terrible sinner, I'd be an axe murderer, I'd be a rapist, I'd be a murderer if it wasn't for you. Oh God, you know, that's not prayer. Got news for you, that's not worship either. That That's just, you're just lamenting what could have been. That's all you're doing. And I, I know people, I've had people in the church who were like that. And Tommy, I don't want to be around them people when I'm trying to pray. I want to be around people who can become as intimate, who have that same intimate walk with God that I have. I've talked about my friend over the years, Sister Chambers, at the uh, Pentecostal Church in East Texas many years ago that I once attended and was part of. And Sister Chambers was in her 80s. And every day I drove school bus. Every day I had about a four-hour break during the day between runs. You know, I'd do my morning runs. I'd have a break. Then I'd go do the afternoon runs. And I'd go to Sister Chambers. She and I became very close friends. And I'd go to her house, not every day, but quite often. We would sit there, and because we both understood spirituality and not religion, we could be talking about something, and all of a sudden I'd be talking about somebody that I used to know, and I'd tell her, I'd say, you know, I've had such a burden for this woman lately. I, she's been so heavy on my heart lately. I don't know what it is, but I feel like she's, she's in trouble, like something's going on. And before we knew it, the Spirit of the Lord had touched both she and I, and there was another lady from the church there as well, Sister Russell. And the Spirit of the Lord touched all three of us. And before we knew it, all three of us were down on our knees praying at our chairs, at the coffee table, wherever. We were in the living room. We were all praying and we were speaking in tongues and praying in the Spirit and praying. And 30 minutes later, we opened our eyes and looked around and we were all on our knees praying for this woman. They didn't even know the woman that I was talking about. But you see, when you've got that intimacy with God, the Holy Ghost can communicate to you what he's saying is true. This person is in trouble. You need to pray for her. And it's not a matter of voicing it to you, but you feel it. I don't even know how to describe it. You feel it. And when you feel it in your spirit, immediately you react to it. You respond to it. And before we even knew what we were doing, we fell on our knees and we were praying for this woman. Were we holding hands? Did we say, oh, let's hold hands and pray for this woman. No. No. Didn't have to. That's how religion might respond. But spirituality doesn't need that. Intimacy with God doesn't need that. When you know how to get in the Spirit and be in the Spirit, then you don't need that. I've had people in our church that I wished, wished, had a spiritual walk, had an intimate walk with God, so that maybe while we were visiting, maybe while we were sitting in my living room talking sometime, they and I both could go into the Spirit and begin to pray together in the Spirit and begin to feel the move of the Holy Ghost, and it never happened. Tell me now one time. You know why? Because that person's religion was all based on that old teaching. Well, this is how you do things. This is how things are done. When you pray, you know, you say, oh, let us pray. When you do this, you say, let us do this. When you do that, you, you, do you follow what I'm saying? Spirituality and intimacy is based on the closeness that we feel to God by reason of His Spirit communing and fellowshipping with our spirit. In Matthew 23, 1 through 7, the word of God said, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. In other words, they teach. Do as I say and not as I do. 
for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Spirituality is not about living your religion for the view of others. People might wonder, well, Pastor, I watch your services online and I don't see you shouting. I don't see you talking in tongues. I don't see you dancing. Uh, yeah, you don't, but honey, got news for you. Don't think it don't happen. Don't think I don't do it when I'm home alone. Don't think when I'm praying by myself, I'm not praying in the Holy Ghost. Don't think when I'm worshiping alone by myself. Honey, I, I every time I get in a car by myself, Tommy can tell you because I do it half the time when he's there. Every time I get into a car by myself, a prayer meeting is called. you know why? Because I'm there and I'm alone with God. There's that intimacy. There's that connection. There's that opportunity for he and I to make love. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? There's that opportunity for God and I to make love because I'm alone with God. I love to go to Oklahoma because for hours I'm able to be alone with God and pray and worship. And honey, I'm going to tell you, there are times I've got to just about pull over on the side of the road so I can shout a while. I'm worshiping God. I'm shouting. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm glorifying God. Well, I'm having a time while I'm driving my car. But see, I don't do these things in your view because they're not meant to be done in your view. They're not meant to be done for your benefit. They're not meant to be done as a show. This ain't a dog and pony show. Pentecost is not a dog and pony show. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm almost done today. I don't like when I'm watching videos online and stuff and they zero in on somebody receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost or they zero in on somebody uh, dancing and shouting because that's an intimate time for that person with God. That's meant to be, that's not supposed to be a time of public demonstration. That's not supposed to be a time for uh, what is happening to be uh, pl plastered all over the internet. No. When the Holy Ghost touches somebody, when the Spirit of the Lord moves on somebody, that is a time of intimacy. Leave them alone. That, that, don't be splattering that all over the internet. Oh, but we want people to see that the Spirit of God is moving in our church. Why? Because if they come to church, they won't be able to see it. I want to tell you a little secret. The first time I ever walked into Riverside Church of God, I was born and raised in a Pentecostal church up north. We had a wonderful move of the Holy Ghost in the church I was raised in. We had a wonderful move of the Holy Ghost. But it was different than it was down here in the south. We didn't shout the way people do down south. We didn't dance, at least by the time I was a kid. I understand they did before I was a kid. Some of the ladies and People used to shout and dance, but by the time I was a kid, things had changed and we didn't have that happening so much. We had tongues and interpretation, we had prophecy, our, our services were loud and boisterous and demonstrative, but in a different way than it was down south. I came down to Texas, I arrived on Saturday. That next morning, my Aunt Dorothy took me to Riverside Church of God. Had never been there. Had never walked into that church a day in my life. All I knew about is what I'd heard Aunt Dorothy talk about. She said, oh, in our church we shout and we dance and my God, the Holy Ghost moves and blah, blah, blah. That's all I knew. I had shouted and I had danced in the Holy Ghost only in my room, in private, at home as a teenager. Never had that happen in church. Never. 
I walked into Riverside Church of God. I'll never forget it as long as I live. The minute I walked through the door of that church, Tommy, I felt that intimacy with the Holy Ghost. I could feel the Spirit of the Lord in a way. I said, my God, I've never walked through the door of a church and felt the Holy Ghost like I feel the Holy Ghost here. It was different. We began to sing and worship, and I just felt this liberty. It was like the Spirit of the Lord was saying to me, You can worship me here from your spirit. You have nothing to fear. You don't have to worry about nothing. You can worship me from your spirit. And they began to sing a song that I had never heard a day in my life called, uh, His Love Lights the Way. I've left the old paths I traveled so long. I'm happy, redeemed, and free. Of Jesus, my Lord, I sing a sweet song. His love lights the way for me. His love lights the way I travel today. I'm shouting the victory. My sadness is past. I'm happy at last. His love lights the way for me. They started on the second verse. And all of a sudden, I, oh my God, I'll never forget it as long as I live. All of a sudden, I leaped up on my feet and I began to dance and dance in that church. I just danced all over and I danced and they kept singing and I kept dancing. And I felt like a bird that had been let out of a birdcage. I felt so free and so liberated. I felt like the Holy Ghost and I were just having a wonderful love-making session. Oh, I was just having this intimate time with God. I didn't, I would First time in this church, I did not see one person dance prior to me doing this. I did not hear one person shout prior to me doing this. After the service, people were telling me, oh, young man, what a blessing today to watch the Holy Ghost touch you. You know why? Because when you have that intimate walk with God, you know what that is. You know when somebody is touched of God, when somebody's blessed by the Holy Ghost and they shout or they dance, and you you feel that joy. You appreciate the intimacy that they've experienced. It's just like seeing a couple that are deeply in love and you see them uh, hugging and kissing. You know, uh, many of our former presidents, except for the most recent one, whose marriage was a joke and a shambles. But many of our former presidents, and I believe our current president, they love their wives, and their wives love them. And on occasion, you'd see them share a little hug or a kiss or something, and it would touch you. You know, you'd feel good about that because you knew that it was a genuine expression of love. They weren't doing that for your benefit. They were doing that between themselves. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's the same thing in our walk with God. When we do things, and it's not for the benefit of the viewer, it's not for the benefit of those around us, but at the same time they appreciate it they benefit from it in some small way because they know that it, it is an expression of sincere uh, yes it is intimacy <laughs> they know it's an expression of sincere intimacy with God amen God has not called us today to live a religion in the sight of men by reason of the Holy Ghost baptism he has called us into intimacy with himself if you've not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost let me tell you all you have to do is want it everybody needs it but not everybody wants it <laughs> all you have to do is want it and give God the opportunity. Take time. Listen to some gospel music. Get in a frame of mind where you're worshiping God and worshiping the Lord. Sit before Him silently. Pray. Worship God. And say, Lord, fill me. Fill me today to overflowing. Amen. With the Holy Ghost and fire. Would you bow your heads with